This is not another Rothschild conspiracy. This mini-documentary is a glance into the complex geopolitical tensions that center around the foundation of one of the most controversial countries in the world and the one man who financed the beginning of a methodological invasion of a deserted land far, far away. A land that is now at war. In this video, we're going to take you back in time. We are going back to before there was a distinction between Israel and Palestine. We are going before the major world wars and the Nazi Holocaust hell. The idea of a promised land for the Jewish people was just a dream and had been for so literal millennia. This was until a series of political factors and one particular family started to build its foundations using a technique established in business as a hostile takeover. But before we dive into this fascinating tale of this infamous old money family implementing a giant geopolitical chess match, please don't forget to subscribe to our channel, give us a like and let us know if you want us to do more videos on complex geopolitical topics affected by great wealth. All About Oil Let's go back together to the year 1880. The Rothschilds were already a colossal global conglomerate, with their fingers in all the lucrative pies the world had to offer. They weren't just players but were orchestrators in the world of business, banking and financing politics. The Industrial Revolution was in full swing and the Rothschilds were already raking in more money than they could ever spend. Oil was a relatively new discovery. Most factories still ran on coal. There were no cars and plastic had been invented 20 years prior but was not yet a major industry. But the world's governments and the major international players had already begun to grasp the transformative potential of this discovery. Now, the Rothschilds were right there in the mix, of course. In 1880, the French banking branch of the Rothschild family acquired a refinery in the micro-country of Fume, which is now part of modern-day Croatia. This quickly became big business and they became the primary suppliers of oil to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. This is relevant for the next part of our story. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was still at war with the Ottoman Empire. This was not the first adventure in oil for the Rothschilds. By this point, they were already the largest and most dominant suppliers of oil of the Russian Empire, with huge political influence there. Now, before we plunge headfirst into the labyrinth of Rothschild's intrigue, we've got to pause a moment to set the stage of the geopolitical context. Trust me, unraveling this is crucial to understanding the rest of our story, and without this context, the Rothschilds would never have been able to found the Jewish dream. And if you're looking for more general history on the Rothschild legacy, our other videos have got you covered. This one will focus on one of their most significant family members, Baron Edmund de Rothschild, and the profound legacy of his actions in setting the contemporary political stage. So picture this, the Ottoman Empire, an ancient power, was coming towards the end of its 400-year existence. And to put it mildly, it was a pain in the behind to everyone around them, including their Islamic State. This was particularly the case for the fledging state of Saudi Arabia, which had realized that they were sitting on colossal oil reserves and were entering into negotiations with France and the UK to become their suppliers. One condition for the Saudis to supply cheap oil, undercutting their American competitors thanks to the Suez Canal, included the slow dismantling of the Ottoman Empire. A little side note for you all, the Suez Canal was also financed by the Rothschild family only 50 years earlier, but I digress. This oil deal was a game changer for Saudi Arabia, providing them with an enormous economic and strategic advantage. Islam is still today a religion with several violently conflicting interpretations of the faith, and this was particularly the case between the Saudis and the Ottomans at the time. The Ottomans placed the Sultan as the head of faith, but the Wahhabi Saudi interpretation was far stricter and heavily Quranic. This new wealth allowed the Saudis to rapidly begin propagating their interpretation of the faith. For France and the UK, the deal was definitely a win-win. Of course, they were able to break free from costly oil deals with the USA and the treacherous Atlantic crossing, but there was also a much longer game at play. Though the Ottomans kept the Austro-Hungarian Empire busy and uninterested in any Western expansion, an Islamic empire continued to present a great political threat to the West. Financed by banks already owned by various members of the Rothschild French family branch, these European politicians quickly began realizing that it would be fundamental to ensure a permanent ally in the region to stop any future Islamic empire from returning. This opened the door to the Zionist dream. Operation Rothschild – Zionism In the grand tapestry of history, the year 1880 holds another significant historical concurrence. At the time, the Jewish population found its largest clusters in Russia and Germany. 
with their diaspora stretching over 2,000 years since fleeing the Roman Empire. But in Russia, a storm was brewing. Anti-Semitism was at an all-time high, culminating in the harrowing pogroms, violent riots that sent the Jewish community fleeing for safety. Enter our enigmatic figure, 35-year-old French Baron Edmund de Rothschild, a man already worth an astonishing estimated $2 billion in 1880. This would be around $60 billion today, making him perhaps the wealthiest single Rothschild in the history of the family. Edmund saw an opportunity to bring his dream of Zionism to life. Now, Zionism is at its core the belief in a Jewish homeland, a promised land rooted in the ancient texts of the Torah. But politically, it was a much more complex puzzle. A location needed to be established, and there wasn't exactly land going spare. You see, even though there were already Jewish communities living peacefully in Palestine, as well as various other places, the larger geopolitical context was quite different than in the Torah. The region was now an Islamic state under Ottoman rule, and the world had moved on significantly in the 2000 years since the Roman Empire. Due to the sudden surge of Jew-targeted conflict in Russia, the Rothschilds were approached by the noble family to help finance a new railway stretching from Baku to the Red Sea. This railway played a pivotal role in aiding Russian Jews to flee the horrors of the pogroms, allowing them to find refuge within the relative safety of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans were receptive, but they harbored concerns. They were well aware of Zionist ambitions, and they knew that not all Palestinian Arab Jews were politically aligned with this ideology. But their major worry was the potential incursion onto Muslim land. As a response, they enacted a law that restricted Jewish settlement in Palestine to a mere 30 days, after which they could settle elsewhere within the empire. This would not do for Baron de Rothschild. He devised a clever strategy, setting up a network of shell companies, which he used to begin acquiring land in Palestine. Thanks to an Ottoman law permitting foreign nationals, except Ashkenazi Jews, to purchase land in Palestine, he used his personal treasury, known as Hazina i Hassa, to acquire nearly 20% of the territory by 1914. The Ottomans found themselves utterly befuddled by this relentless strategy. On the other side of the empire, the Rothschild family were supplying resources in great numbers to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, who were eating away at the military defenses of the Ottomans, distracting them from the invasion within. Intriguing, isn't it? The next steps become crucial in the context of the current geopolitical climate. Let's delve deeper into the actual mechanisms of the Rothschild's pivotal role in shaping the history of the Middle East and the Zionist dream. This is a tale that weaves together wealth, ambition, and geopolitics in a way that continues to stir conversations and controversies to this very day. The Palestine Jewish Colonization Association PICA. Owning land was of course not the goal for Edmund de Rothschild and the rest of the family. They weren't just after a slice of the global pie and were already huge landowners worldwide. What is controversial is the technique for creating this invasion was more akin to a hostile corporate takeover than direct warfare. Instead of stocks, it was land they were rapidly acquiring. Despite the illegality of this situation under Ottoman law, they were quickly moving refugee Jewish families into the land they had purchased. In 1899, Edmund de Rothschild created an investment fund called the Palestine Jewish Colonization Association. The name alone speaks volumes, especially given today's heated political climate. Whether you're waving the pro-Zionist flag or you're against the occupation of Palestine, the name leaves little room for ambiguity. This was colonization in a hurry, a bold, even hostile move. Indeed, the PICA was a branch of a larger organization called the Jewish Colonization Association based in America and founded by the Hirsch family, another incredible influential and wealthy Jewish family. The GCA goal was the Zionist dream, and they were investigating a wide variety of options for the promised land. Palestine was not the only one. This included Argentina, the USA, Turkey, and Canada, where various colonies were created. However, none of these other countries had any political advantages for France and the UK compared to a colony in Palestine. France and the UK, along with neighbors Saudi Arabia, quickly began supplying weaponry and resources to the PICA for their accelerated settlement. Now, the story doesn't stop there. The Rothschilds weren't just writing checks and buying land. They were investing in a vision. They poured resources into agriculture, infrastructure, schools, healthcare, you name it. They were all in for the Jewish settlers, creating the building blocks for what we know today as Israel. Current political climate. Let's jump forward to today and the war happening between Hamas and Israel around the Gaza Strip. Although not directly about the Rothschilds, we need to talk about it briefly as it plays into their hands. Gaza is now a tiny strip of land, a mere 41 kilometers across and 6 to 12 kilometers wide strip of land enclosed on four sides by three meter high walls, barbed wire, and a complex defense system in which over 2 million people live. 
By proportion, Gaza is 1% of the land area of Israel, but has a population equal to 20% of Israel, quite the turning of the table and under full military occupation. It is hard not to express any political or ethical opinion about Gaza and Israel in the context of the current emotional scenes on both sides of the wall, from the difficult living conditions imposed by Israel, regularly called out by the United Nations and the World Health Organization as inhumane, to the horrors of the Hamas militant group. So let's instead focus on why the conflict is happening. Israel is not universally recognized as a country. Most Islamic states in the Middle East do not accept Israel as a state. The fall of the Ottoman Empire put the entire region into the hands of the British Empire, where a British mandate in 1948 granted independence to the area, establishing it as the State of Israel. This immediately created an international war, as these neighboring countries did not accept the sovereignty of Israel. The reaction is that Arab Palestinians were forced to flee and were funneled into an area of ceasefire called the Green Line. The UN estimates that more than 700,000 Palestinians were forcefully expelled or fled from Israel armed forces during the conflict. With the political tensions between Israel and the Islamic world continuing to boil over with several conflicts ongoing, extremist right-wing propaganda continues to persist on both sides of the conflict, fueling the hatred warfare and the regular explosion and overreactions of Hamas and the Israel military. Hamas, a terrorist or militant organization, rose to power in Gaza because the people are desperate and in desperation seek extremism. Meanwhile, the political power of Israel grows amongst its allies. For let's not forget how conveniently it is placed for the West to have military and commercial bases near the Middle East, breaking up the Islamic coast at the north of the Suez Canal. This is particularly good for our protagonist's family. The Rothschilds always win. How the Rothschilds profit from this war. To put it bluntly, war is profitable, but banking is better. The Rothschilds continue to be one of the primary financiers of arms and production worldwide, with only specific exclusion policies around controversial weaponry. It's hard to trace, as they fund everyone and have been funding all wars since the Napoleonic times. So it lends that today, in this war, their investment strategy is no different. The Rothschilds also have a great investment in the right-wing political climate of Israel, particularly when it comes to the relationship with Iran. The Rothschilds ultimately are bankers. They have no real interest in war or politics, but in money and power. Iran is now considered in Western news and political rhetoric as the great evil of the Middle East. Researchers have pointed out that Iran is one of only three countries left in the world whose central bank does not have any direct Rothschild bank loans, along with Cuba and North Korea. Since Israel's funding in the Middle East, the Rothschild family has a huge amount of influence over the financial movements in the region and continues to profit from the conflict, ensuring the political pressure remains on Iran and its central banks as well as defending the Zionist ambitions.